instead of just viewing them as the method that we get our next new car. Right? See, we love our students. Okay, I can't tell you how many students. I know where they live because I've taken them home. Right? I know their parents. I have their parents' phone. My students hate the fact that their mothers and fathers call me up, right? or that I call them up. Right? Or they get home and they're like, I am teen prayers. So whatever he said you did, you did. Right? But that's our history. Right? How many of us remember the folks who came to the doorsteps of our colleges dropped off by parents who this was their dream? Listen, I had a wonderful upper middle class background and upbringing. But that was because my mother from waterproof Louisiana went to Dillard University where her mother went to college. But my mother and her first cousin who were raised as sisters, the families were so poor that they couldn't afford tuition and two sets of clothes. So they sent the young ladies to college with one set of clothes because education was more important than fashion. Now that might not have been a problem, except my mother was 5'11 and my aunt was 5'4. Okay? Now, let my mother tell it, you know, she got plenty of dates. I don't know how, right? Not when your clothes and shirts are like this, right? Just kidding, Mom. I was just playing. Don't, you know. But my point is, we have to embrace them. And if we embraced our students, we'd have no reason to fear their access to the media. If they understood that they were partners in this journey, that our success is their success we wouldn't have to fear them having access to social media. My students follow me on Twitter. I follow them. Now, they've gotten a lot smarter about what they put on Twitter, right? Because maybe you shouldn't put that you are so drunk in the dorm when there's no alcohol on campus, right? <laughs> then when you get a knock on the door and it's your college president saying, give me the bottle. <laughs> and you're suspended, right? So. My point is that we have the ability to make our own noise. We have the resources to do so. So it's inexcusable for us not to be able to get our stories out when you can get them out yourselves. No one can have a smaller media budget than we do. And no school gets more media coverage than my 208 student school. Right? New York Times, Wall Street Journal, HBCU Digest, Chronicle of Higher Education, Dallas Morning News, there's a reason. One, because we're doing something. Right? That's the first thing, because you can't tell stories that aren't true. All right? But secondly, it's because we are afraid, unafraid to advocate for ourselves. Now, the next song title that we're going to use is not a public <laughs> enemy song. It's a James Brown song. And it's called Papa's Got a Brand New Bag. <laughs> HBCUs, it is time to get a brand new bag. How much longer are we going to sit here and cry about what we don't have? I come from this school of thought. If I have a cello and I am down to one string, I am going to play the hell out of the symphony. I can play with my one string. I'm not worried about what I don't have. I'm more concerned about all the things I do have. So we as HBCUs, we have to evolve. We have to look at problems differently than we do today. Case in point, we have 146 acres of land. At one point, we tried to do an um, evaluation of our land, the value of our land. And one of the banks tried to tell us that our land was worthless. Now, I don't really understand that because we have 146 acres of land, 10 minutes from downtown Dallas. We're off of I-45, which is a major interstate highway. It intersects immediately with I-20, which is another major interstate highway. So we sit at the nexus of two interstate highways 10 minutes from downtown Dallas. How can you tell me my 146 acres have no value? One of the most ridiculous things I've ever heard. So we decided to have some fun with it. We also were in a food desert. So we turned our football field into a farm. Now, some people got mad about the whole football thing, OK? First of all, we weren't in the Big Ten or the SEC, OK? 
we weren't getting bowl game money. <laughs> we weren't getting television money. We lost every game. Okay. <laughs> It was not pretty. Disciplinary problems, once you stripped it all away, you found a football player somewhere in there. Academic problems, we won't even talk about that, okay? So why would we keep spending 800 to a million dollars a year on a sport that brought us nothing that we needed? Other than the fact that we had some staff members who wanted to sit up in the boxes and be big time. Well, you are not going to live out your dreams on the backs of my students, All right? So football went away. We turned the football field into a farm. In the two and a half years that we've had the farm, we've grown over 10,000 pounds of food. We give away 10% of everything we grow. It's called tithing to the community. We have our, we serve some of the food in the cafeteria, and then we sell the rest of it because after all, we are business people. Okay, as Jay-Z would say, I'm not a business man, I'm a business man, okay? That is, right, I know I just lost a whole generation of people in here with that one. I got it, but, but look, if you don't know what the students are saying, how are you gonna know the students? Just a random thought, all right? So the reality of it is we sell to restaurants, we sell to individuals. We even sell to the Dallas Cowboys, right? So they serve our food at their stadium. Okay, that's looking at things differently. Now, another group of people got mad at me when we did that because they said, oh, come on, man. We sent the kids to school to get out of the fields. You're putting them back in the field. I didn't teach, say I was gonna teach them to be farmers. I'm teaching them to be owners. Right, to be entrepreneurs, okay? We don't have any farming classes. All of our classes are business classes. But if you don't know what you're doing, then people will take advantage of you, right? So how about you have to be competent in that which is going to be a business opportunity? So our students farm, right? But it's about creating an urban food distribution network. Next up is we're gonna own grocery stores. Right? We are already raising money for grocery stores. So we're going to put a grocery store on our campus. Our students are going to become the folks who work in those grocery stores. Now, to help facilitate this, we are transforming ourselves into the country's first historically black work college. Right? Now, you might not be familiar with work colleges. There are seven of them. Berea College in Kentucky, uh, College of the Ozarks in Missouri, some of you, not Warren Wilson in North Carolina, right? So these schools, the students work in addition to go to school. Now, we already do that, okay? So the best way to think about this is work study on steroids, okay? But here's the thing. What we realized is all of our students worked. Over 90% of our students are on Pell, okay? So they all had to have some kind of job. And what we noticed was that when they did jobs off campus, their grades were negatively impacted. Because too many of my students had to work the midnight shift at FedEx. And if you work the midnight shift at FedEx, you are not getting up for your 9 o'clock biology class. You're not getting up for your 9 o'clock biology class. You're not going to pass biology. So you are being penny wise and dollar foolish. Because you, all you know is you've got to help your family. Now instead of judging them, why don't we help them? All right? So we changed to this format and we're in the process of doing that now, so the students will work. So it's been two years working on campus, right? And then after that, the next two years, we will place them in internships around the city. So now our students are in corporations and doctor's offices and businesses, giving themselves a leg up and being hired into the careers that they are passionate about when they graduate. It's about creating competitive advantages, right? That is what we are doing. So we help them mitigate their loan debt. We give them real life training skills. We help the institution and we position them for career success. All right, now, that seemed perfectly logical to me. So we did that, okay? That's evolving, all right? But the critical part about how we evolved was we took a look around and realized that our mission was serving leadership, not unlike a ton of other colleges out there, but 
folks didn't think that maybe it was time that we freshen up what servant leadership means. So our students were disconnected to the idea of servant leadership. So we redefined it. Right? So for us now, servant leadership is the three E's, educational leadership, ethical leadership, and economic leadership. Because if you can't fund your dream, you no longer have your dream. Right? He or she who funds your dream now has co-opted your dream, owns your dream, adjusted your dream, and gave you a new dream. That is the definition of having no power. Because if I fund you, you will do what I tell you to do. And that may make you uncomfortable, but that does not make it untrue. So we think that we have to attack that. So we identified a Bible passage, and we called it the Quinite Bible passage. Right? It's Isaiah 58, 9 through 12. And I'm not going to read the entire passage to you, because we already know you all don't do well in call and response. All right, we've already covered that. All right, but the message of that Bible passage, quite simply, is rebuild old roads and structures. Stop speaking ill of people. Be an asset. Well, you know what? If the students come to you and you've been told their whole lives that they are not academically prepared to compete, if they come to you and the median family income is $24,000 a year, so they're not economically prepared to compete, you have to give them something that makes them stand up straight. I can teach you to stand up straight because every person has these. Every person has this. And whether or not you can compete from day one is how well I teach you to use your heart and your hands while I am empowering your mind. Because once you start having success, you love having success. And it inspires you. And then you become great. And our goal is greatness, period. I mean, that's it. That's the only language we speak at Falkland College. Be great or be gone. It's up or out, okay? Now, that doesn't mean that we expect you to be great on day one. We expect you to put forth a great effort. You can put forth a great effort. If you are doing that, the rest of it starts to come. So these things are incredibly important. And we, we are proud of what we have done. All right, I mean, let's take a look at this. You talk about partnerships. So our first partner was Yale University, okay? Yale University was our partner in terms of converting the farm to the football field. They mentored us, okay? They allowed myself, some of my students to come and watch what they do on their um, food, Center for Food Sustainability, or Yale Sustainability Food Project. All right, our second partner, University of Pennsylvania's Graduate School of Education and Dr. Mary Beth Gassman. Now, when I took the job at Paul Quinn, I tried to find great fundraisers. No one would come help me raise money for Paul Quinn. In fact, everyone looked at me like I had lost my mind. And they said, well, you don't have enough resources. I'm like, well, if I had resources, I wouldn't be talking to you. <laughs> right? That's your job. You're supposed to help us find resources. So what we did, after you know, being told no more times than I care to remember, just got angry. Decided we'll do it ourselves because there's clearly an opportunity. I'm going to bet there are more people like us who need this service and don't have access to it. So that is a business opportunity for Paul Quinn College. So we partnered with Mary Beth. She designed a center for fundraising and philanthropy. We are the first historically black college in the country to have one. We are only the second institution, period, to offer an undergraduate degree in fundraising and philanthropy. And now, when people want to learn how to raise money, they're going to pay us. Okay? That is turning the equation around. That's playing your string. That's evolution. All right? And these things are important. All right? So that's what we did with UPenn. Next up, we created this amazing partnership with one of my alma maters, Duke University. Starting in 2014, 15 Duke students, well, in the 2014 fall semester, 15 Duke students and 15 Paul Quinn students will go to school together. They will spend three weeks living at Duke. They'll spend three weeks living at Paul Quinn. They will then need psychiatric counseling for roughly a year after that because the, their minds will be shattered, okay? <laughs> but the subject matter is going to be the sustainable economic development of the Paul Quinn College community. 
three Duke professors, one Paul Quinn professor. That's a partnership. Okay, so that allows me to offer my gifted students an entree into some of the best graduate programs in the country. Like, that's important because you have to show them where they're going, right, and teach them that they can go anywhere they want to go as long as they are prepared to work for it. So we're proud of that. Right? We're proud of that partnership. Now, we also are changing our teaching methodology, and we are embracing experiential learning. So we are using positive project learning as the means of communicating the lesson plan. So we beta tested this in several classes, some of which have been mine. So in my classes, my students are taught through solving problems. All right? And I can teach anything using a problem. For example, I wanted to teach Freakonomics. Okay? My students were a little weirded out by Freakonomics. They don't think of themselves as economists. That's easy to teach. As part of my class, you have to read the Sunday New York Times because you're quizzed on the Sunday Times. And you're verbally quizzed. Right? So which means I will sit and ask you any question from any section of the Times. So they have to read the whole thing. Freaks them out. They fail it miserably the first month and a half of the class. Then they figure out how to read the paper, and they get it, and they do much better. And their confidence increases. But here's what's interesting. They don't sell the New York Times in our part of the city. Can't find it. Right? Now think about the demographic of people who read the New York Times. College-educated people, right? Are we not a college? Are we not producing college-educated people? So why can't we get a convenience store, because there are no grocery stores, why can't we get a convenience store that sells the New York Times? So my students spent an entire day trying to find the New York Times in the southern part of the city of Dallas. It wasn't until they went across the river that they found it. They just figured out the key to Freakonomics. Once they had a Freakonomic experience, they devoured that book, right? Because it became alive to them. It became real to them. They understood it. All of our classes are moving in that direction. Now, this is important because if you are taking students from under-resourced communities that don't have traditional, whatever traditional learning styles means, right? I still don't know really what that means. But let's just say they have non-traditional learning styles. You still have to teach them. You still have to find a way to connect with them. But if you teach them how to solve the problems of their own communities, it works. So that's what we're doing. We are creating a new urban model for colleges. And we are teaching our students to solve the problems of their own communities. And we are excited about that. But again, that's evolution. That's institutional evolution. Now, the next stage of evolution has to be my own, right? Because if my institution is to grow and develop, then I have to grow and develop. Now, I spent the first six years visiting an unbelievable amount of college campuses, right? because our goal is to become one of America's great small colleges. So I went to visit great small colleges and saw the way they did things. Whitman College in Walla Walla, Washington has an amazing retention rate and an amazing alumni giving rate, better than any of the other institutions I've seen. So, dragged my family out to Walla Walla, Washington one August and met with their faculty and their president to learn what they do. Uh, went to Howard University, sat down with Pat Swigert when he wrapped up the $300 million capital campaign, because that's the largest capital campaign that's ever been done at any African American institution of any type. So was very appreciative for learning what he did. Uh, went to Hendricks College, went to Millsaps College in Mississippi, have been to Wilberforce when Floyd Flake was there because he pioneered a really innovative way of accessing government funding. So we needed to learn that as well. All told, I've probably been to 40 colleges in six years. Okay, I have a list of notes, um, pictures. I went to Fisk. I just didn't meet with anybody. Right? I just walked around the campus, talked to people. Found out the lady in the bookstore was not very happy. <laughs> okay, That was a couple years ago. All right? It was a very interesting conversation. Because you learn a lot from people when they don't know you're looking. All right? So, and I appreciated those opportunities. I learned about ceremony and pomp and circumstance of historically black colleges by going to the inauguration of the president at Morehouse at the time. All right? That was a wonderful trait. So you have to become a student for yourself. So my next step in my evolution is I have to go get my doctorate. 
right? Because that's going to be important for the institution that we're building. Now, I can be fine without it, but I might not be fine tomorrow without it because you always want to have the respect of your peers. And if you aren't willing to put in the work, how can you expect them to? So I'm going to do a doctorate. Pretty excited about that. Not going to now. Thank you. I'm not going to announce where quite yet, but suffice to say that someone sitting in this audience will see me in the hallways uh, next year. Uh, <laughs> but I will not be leaving my job to do it. Right? I will do both. Because if my students can work and go to school, why can't I? Right? You lead by example. Right? If you don't believe it, then don't say it. If you can't do it, then don't say it. Because our students are watching. And they are paying attention. And they want to model the behavior we are teaching them. And I think that is incredibly important. Now, the last song, before I take questions, I'm going to tip my hat to our country music <laughs> place. And it's going to be I Hope You Dance, right, by Leanne Womack. All right, which is an amazing song. There should have been one song that everybody in here could have gotten. Okay, I'm trying. Okay, next time I'll pick some Anita Baker and Sade songs, and maybe that'll get us okay. But I hope you dance. Simply celebrate where we are. Celebrate who you are. Celebrate what we are. All right, this should be fun. This is the hardest job I have ever had. This is the best job that I've ever had. I wake up every day. I don't even need my alarm clock. All right? My wife gets annoyed every morning. All right? She has to set her alarm, and I'm already up, excited, working. All right? That should inspire you. It should inspire you. Educating your own communities, kids, what could be better? People are trusting you with their future. So how can you not be committed to greatness? How can you not be committed to excitement and excellence? That's why you're here. So as you sit and ponder what you do tomorrow, be thankful for today, right, really. Because today is not promised to us, all right? And guys, this, this is a gift. We have a chance to be remembered by history. One day, maybe people won't just read Booker T. Washington or Du Bois or, or Charles Johnson, right? Maybe they read Brandy Jackson. Maybe they read Crystal de Gregory, all right? Maybe they stumble into a chapter on Michael Sorrell, right? But that should be our goal. Our goal should be to do things that are historically significant, right? I am unashamed of the fact my dream is to do something so substantial that I will be viewed as one of the top five college presidents of all time. Right? Now, if I haven't done anything that merits that, I don't want to be considered that. Right? I hope that I can look behind me and see thousands of students whose lives I impacted through my very simple philosophies we over me. The needs of the community must always come before the wants of the individual. And the four L's of the Quinite Nation. Leave places better than you found them. Live a life that matters. Lead from wherever you are. And for God's sake, love something greater than yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Very kind. So, what can I tell you? What would you like to know? Yes, sir. Could you stand up? Yes. Speak into the mic. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you for an, um, an excellent, you know, presentation. Oh, you're very kind. Thank um, you. I am an alum of uh, an HBCU, Alabama State University. Hornets, and, uh, right? The Hornets. Yes. Oh, okay. Right, the Hornets. And uh, 
yeah, so we can celebrate the Hornets along with the Tigers. Um, and I also worked at a Tiger Nation, Tennessee State University, for there 35 years. There you go. Uh, where I um, uh, established you know, the African Studies Department in 1994. And so everything that you've said, based on my experiential learning and my um, you know, professional experience, um, and I was a professor because I was professing something, right? Um, if you could just um, state for all of our benefit, because mm -hmm. um, what you said made so much sense, and it, it, it hit the nail right on the head, and I would co-sign most of what you said that I understood. Um, if you were just to state in a paragraph your core values, and your guiding philosophy, so we can organize all of what you said in our sure. heads, sure. and hopefully we can go back and advocate and sell it to some of these college presidents that are either tearing the schools up, don't know what they're doing, or going in the wrong direction. Uh, <laughs> I feel like that was a setup to get on my peers, right? Uh, I'm going to say this, my core values no, I know why you said it, because it's true. We had a person at Tennessee State University for two years who intentionally tried to tear the school up. And now we have a president now, Dr. Glover, who came to us from Jackson State, mm -hmm. who has a vision, and it coincided much with what you're saying. I don't know if you know her. No, I don't know But I think she is the answer, and she's the first African American woman. Mm -hmm. state right. state and I think she has the ability to be a transformative leader, but she's going to have to clean up a lot of No, bro, I, I got all that. I understand. <laughs> I understand. All of us are cleaning up messes. Okay. All right, I mean, let me be clear. When I showed up, we had a 1% graduation rate. Okay? I mean, everything was broken. We couldn't even lock the doors electronically. So every day, when I left, I was always the last one to leave, the security would come down and use a chain and padlock. We didn't have call waiting on the phone. Right? So I understand cleaning up messes. Right? Um, my God in philosophy is really very simple. It is we over me. Right? It's no more complicated than that. Like, we over me, the four L's of Quinite leadership, I made all that up. Okay, like I took my personal value system and brought it to my college. And I did that because we needed something to hold on to. Right? Something that that was capable of articulating who we were gonna be. And then I got lucky, right? One of our alums pointed me to the Isaiah 58, 9 through 12 Bible passage, which you know said it far more eloquently than I ever could. Let me say this in defense of some of my brothers and sisters who are HBCU presidents. It's a tough job. Right? It's a tough job. But also, not all of them are there for the right reasons. Okay? But a whole lot more of them are. And we tend to beat up them for the sins of a few. And I can tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt, I'm proud to be a member of the HBCU President Club. Okay? I respect what folks are doing. Um, a lot of them are inspirational to me. I think many of our issues just stem from the fact that they are such difficult jobs. Um, I, my way is not going to be right for everyone. Okay, there are plenty of schools who boards who look at me and think I'm radioactive. That's okay. I like the board I have. <laughs> I like the school I have. I look at some of them and think they're radioactive. So my point is, let's celebrate who we are. Let's inspire instead of tear down. But it has to start from a place of unselfishness. Right? Make, there's this wonderful quote by Marcus Aurelius. And it says, choose the harder right over the easier wrong without regard to self-interest. So that would be the other thing. If you remember nothing else by what I said, we over me, the four L's, and choose the harder right over the easier wrong without regard for self-interest. 
If you take those three things away, you will be fine. What else? And President Sewell, you will determine how many questions uh, you will take. Oh, man, to I'll, his answer, time. I'll answer as long as people want to ask. Mr. President, bless you. Thank you for being here today. Um, HBCU Nation, right now, enrollment about 300,000 strong. Uh, if you could uh, just briefly comment on um, if you've heard any buzz about <clears throat> what uh, may be done with this change in PLUS loan criteria, yeah. Yeah. qualification for student loans, which cost us like 14 to 15,000 kids last fall couldn't go back to school because they changed the criteria in the PLUS loans. I'm sure you're aware of that. <laughs> Very yeah, much so. Yeah, exactly. This, um, um, what's the buzz out there on yeah. what we be coming on the pike in terms of maybe being able to uh, take a look at that? And, sure. Yeah. Let me, let me, before I do that, it just occurred to me there's probably some press here. And press has a tendency to only write the negative thing. Our graduation rate is no longer 1%. Okay, it, it, it's, it's improved tremendously. Last semester, we got our retention rate up to 83%. All right, now, we are an institution whose graduation rate will not reflect what it really is for another several years because of the hard decisions that we made in terms of excusing students away from our institution. We knew that going in. All right, we're playing this for the long haul, All right? This is a 30-year plan. All right, so I just wanna make sure we're clear on that. Now, on the PLUS loans. Um, We have lost 14,000 students because their parents, who wanted to help the students pay for college, couldn't qualify to help them. I'm not sure how folks didn't realize when you changed the lending criteria that we were going to be adversely impacted, okay? But, but that did happen. Um, there are some steps being put in place now, I've been told, that will hope to reverse some of that damage. The problem is, and we all know this is true, if you've been out of school for a year, how many of those 14,000 are coming back? Right? So we've lost them. And we lost them and we didn't have to lose them. But that's why, quite honestly, Events like this are so important because this is where those conversations should take place, right? We need someone to study the impact of poor public policy on our institutions, okay? Like I think I just gave somebody a dissertation topic, okay? <laughs> I mean, these things are important. We have to have those conversations. And places like this is where those conversations take place. Yes. We have lost at least three generations of, of black males. Aren't we really focusing a, a too much attention on the symptoms rather than the cure, rather than trying to, I, I appreciate what you're doing and this, you're doing a good job. But when we look at where the problem is, is down here in the four, five, six year old, seven, eight, nine, what are we gonna do to get to them? and turn this thing around. We need an operation to turn around, and we're not gonna do it in college. Yeah, so that's an excellent point, but I would tell you that you're aiming too, too high. All right, that's not the problem. The problem is we have people who are having babies that shouldn't be having babies, all right? We, as a community, have to decide that we are going to do something about this issue, all right? Look, it's bigger than the schools. The students are in school, and then they go home to environments that are killing their dreams. So how about we address this holistically? See, the reason we're focused on economic development is because here's what I know. If you teach a man to have a job and a career, he can feed his family. If he can feed his family, 
he can change his family. If he can change his family, he can change his neighborhood. You change the neighborhood, you change the city. Change the city, you change the state. Change the state, change the people. All right? It's that simple. So we've got to address this. We have to meet people where they are and lift them to where we need them to be. So from my standpoint, we are going to announce something in the next couple of years that I am incredibly excited about. Right? And it's a path to college for students and their families, all right? Because anybody ever think about it from this perspective? We take the kids and leave the parents, and then the parents never go anywhere differently. The community never goes anywhere differently. The kid does, but the kid can't go back home because he's outgrown going home. So what if we lift everyone? Right now I'm not, you know, unrealistic. I don't think that we can send everyone to school. But I can provide paths to self-improvement that won't bankrupt my institution. And that's what we're working on. That's part of our new urban college model. Right? I think that we should challenge people. Right? I think if you say to a working mom that you're going to help her and not judge her, I think you make an enormous difference. But I think we have to address the communities. I think we have to address the family structure. Right? Like, it's not OK to have three and four kids by three and four different dads. Right? Listen, at orientation, I have that conversation. Right? And we do it very simply. I ask each student, who here has $300,000? Right? Who has access to $300,000? No one raises their hand. If they did raise their hand, we'd have to redo their financial aid package. Right? But, then I ask them, how many of you have access to $1.50 or have $1.50? And everybody raises their hand. If you have $1.50, you can afford birth control. If you don't have $300,000, you can't afford a child. All right? And we make it simple. Simple math. Right? $1.50 birth control. $300,000 child. Okay? That's raising a child in a southern city. All right? It's not a made-up number. We research that number. All right? But you have to make it plain. And you talk to them about this. Your economic path forward will be compromised by having children out of wedlock. Doesn't mean that you can't succeed. It means it's become more difficult. Again, I'm not judging you. I'm simply giving you the facts. Your life will be more difficult. Why would you want to do that? And then we support our students. Those who come to us with children, we help them. Right? If you come to our school, you, we got kids running around. I mean, like, I used to bring my son, you know, who's three, I used to bring him to the office, all right, because I just love my kid. And, you know, if you wait a long time to have kids, you turn into some incredibly doting dad, right? But that's a whole other story. So my son's, one of his little playpens would be set up. Well, what happened was he outgrew that, but we still had students who needed sometimes to bring their kids. <laughs> so sometimes you could come to the office and we'd have babies in the playpen, right? Because mom's in class. Because mom and the baby in class doesn't work. But why wouldn't we help her care for her child? Right? She's trying to do the right thing. You don't judge, you help. Right? So I think we have to raise our people and help them. And this will be our last question. And since we've heard from two males, we're going to actually take the ladies' question. And, I, and I'm happy to answer any questions people have afterwards. So, Hi. Hey. How are you doing? How are you um, doing? Okay. Yeah. Um, two things. Will you talk about um, when you decide to, to turn away students that were wasting school time? And then would you talk about the young lady who's now running the philanthropy center, who was homeless. Oh, yeah, so. Just, you know, I know yeah, all things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, so <laughs> I, I go out and recruit students, OK? I mean, I don't, I mean, I have a staff, and they go out too. But I love my students, right? So I'm unafraid to walk into any high school in this country and sit down and recruit students. So sometimes it takes me to unusual places. And everything turns into a recruiting opportunity as far as I'm concerned. So I was asked one day to go speak at one of the homeless shelters for Black History Month. 
because after all, I'm a black college president and my calendar is very full during Black History Month. So I go to the homeless shelter, I speak, and this young lady comes up to me afterwards and she says, hey, um, do you think I could ever go to college? I said, absolutely. I said, and furthermore, there will always be room for you at Paul Quinn College. All right, so that's, we have the conversation, she leaves, you know. In August, I'm giving a speech about birth control and all that other stuff, right? She comes up afterwards and says, hey, do you remember me? Which is like the worst question ever, right? Because then you're forced to this uncomfortable situation where you're kind of like, no. Or then you got to lie, and then you're a liar, and it's just all bad, right? So luckily, she saved me because she said before I could answer, she said, I was at Promise House, and you told me I could come to college. And here I am, All right? And I'm blown away at that point. There have been times during her time at Paul Quinn College where we have had to create space in the dorm for she and her two children, all right? Because she's trying to go to school. And she's, she's amazing. She's got, I think it's a 3.4 or 3.6 grade point average. She just was elected Student Government Association president yesterday. Okay, but wait, it gets, it gets way better than that, okay? So we started the fundraising and philanthropy program. And we formed, there's an association of fundraising professionals. It's an organization, an international organization. So we formed a club on our campus. She is the founding president of the club. Now think about that for a moment. Four years ago, she was homeless. Now. She's the founding president of a club whose responsibility is philanthropy. So she's giving, right? I mean, that's very powerful, right? So I'm, I'm so proud of her. I, I mean, you have no idea what it means to me every day to see her and to see the smile she has on her face and to know that she has hope, right? She has hope. Um, now I got all emotional. What was the other part of the question? The other one was how, how you decide to not have people. Oh, oh, oh okay. So, yeah, so this is the thing. I don't think everyone has a right to be in my college. Right? I just don't. It's a brand. Okay? It's a business. Many of you pick Fisk because you wanted to represent the Fisk brand. Well, I think there should be a Paul Quinn College brand. I think Dr. Davis agrees with me, right? So how about everybody can't come? If you're going to mess up our brand, you, you go mess up somebody else's brand, right? But it has to mean something. Now, I believe we should give you an opportunity. And I believe we should bend over backwards to help you take full advantage of that opportunity. But if you don't, and you choose to be destructive to our environment, you can't be here, right? You can't. And I think if more of us took that approach, our institutions would be healthier. Now, let me say, full disclosure, it puts tremendous economic pressures on you, right? I mean, we, we went from 550 to 350, okay, that was a lot. Now, there had to be some cuts on the other side of the balance sheet so that we could be profitable. And with the exception of last year, we had six, seven, and six-figure surpluses three of the last four years. All right, last year, we had to take a hit because we had to do some things differently. It is what it is. But again, that's making decisions based upon the long-term health of my institution and not my next job. All right, so everyone gets two years to prove that they can be a great Quinite. If you have not taken advantage of our retention programs, if you have not taken advantage, we have more internships than we have students who could qualify for them, right? We have more jobs. Right? I mean, let me just brag on my students for a second. My valedictorian last year had one of the best LSAT scores in the country. My salutatorian went to work for Hunt Oil, right? We've had internships at GE, at Pinnacle, I'm sorry, Oracle, at um, God, where are the other places? Amogee Bank. We just had our first student get in inroads. I mean, look, we are doing some pretty amazing things 
And our student demographic hasn't changed that much, right? Like the average ACT score hasn't risen a ton, right? But we are doing more with the students that we have, and we are proud of that. Now, I know I have obliterated Crystal's schedule, um, so anyone else that has a question, I am happy to talk to you out in the hallway. Um, th again, thank you for coming. Thank you for supporting this event. Tell your friends. Next year, commit to bring two and three more people with you. All right, it will be worth their time. And when you see her on the street, give her a hug. All right, and thank you very much for being a great audience. Uh, please thank President Sorrell again. He's a true servant leader. Uh, he does need to catch a flight. Uh, he won't tell you that, but I, I, it's my job to tell you. Are you having a good time? Yes. It's great. We have for you um, two more sessions, one in this room and the other in conference room 1A. In this room, we will have um, a mixture of a great historically um, appealing topic as well as an emerging theme, uh, that of HBCU sports and wellness. We have a guest uh, moderator for this session, Representative Harold Moses Love Jr. Um, will come and take charge in the uh, conference room 1A. We will have uh, two papers again on emerging topics. We'll have one on the LGBTQ experience on the Black College campus, and we will have a reflective um, retrospective of a Fisk alumna. So if you want to stay here, it's great. If you want to meet me in the other session, that's great as well. Just bear with us momentarily. Thank you so much.